Welcome back guys to the channel, the only channel on YouTube that actually makes meta zoo videos. And today guys is going to be the very first episode of the only meta zoo podcast ever. That's right guys, I've decided to make the executive decision and start my very own podcast. I know very original, very, very, uh, very out there, out of the box thinking, you know, but I figured, hey, I have a computer, I have, I have a microphone and I have drinks that I can drink while I'm making the podcast. So today, guys, we're going to be talking about becoming a MetaZoo judge. We're also going to be talking about some of my future plans with uh, with the game. And then we're also going to be, uh, I'm going to be going over some of the YouTube stats because I think YouTube is just really fun. I think the statistics are very fun. I went to school for accounting, so this is this is all this is all my nerd stuff right here. Let's go ahead and get it, guys. <gasps> In case you guys haven't seen me before, hi, I'm Mark. I'm a MetaZoo judge. I've been playing for the past few months, and I have a pretty extensive background in TCGs. I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh back in the day. I think around 2011, 2012, around the Chaos Dragon like agent formats. And ever since I've heard about MetaZoo, I, you know, at first I wasn't like, oh, you know, I need to go and play TCGs again. You know, I had taken multiple years off. It had been at least six years since I'd actually played a physical card game. Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel did bring me back into cards in general, but MetaZoo, I think, really put me back in love with it. So, yeah, I've been playing for the past few months, and I've been having a ton of fun. I recently also just became a judge, a MetaZooologist. And I've been hosting primarily local tournaments down in Multiverse Games, in case y'all are ever down at San Antonio, Texas. We usually host around 7.15 every Thursday. So if you guys are ever interested in Competitive Constructed, we are always there. I've also hosted some Learn to Play events and some Competitive Sealed events. Now I'm going to keep it a sack with you guys. I'm going to keep it 100. When I actually started playing MetaZoo, I was never expecting to become a judge. I wasn't even expecting to sit down for the MZO exam, but, you know, duty calls, uh, yeah, there, we actually did not have a local judge in the area, an official MZO, which, you know, does, if you have an MZO in your local area, I think that can absolutely help boost up players, it can help make the scene more competitive, it can help lure out more people from different areas, and pretty soon at my local, you know, game store, Multiverse, we will be hosting some like actual tournament events. We've been hosting almost exclusively competitive events at this point. And I've been getting some of my guys up on the MPN leaderboards. In case y'all haven't seen, uh, one of our local residents, Antonio, is actually currently number one on the MPN. Also, we have my boy John. He's, I think, 42 right now on the MPN. So overall, I think we're doing pretty good. Now, with being a judge, there's a lot of things, I think, that come with it. I think the number one thing is probably that when you become a judge, you do lose a lot of playing time. Personally, for me, guys, I haven't played as much as I would like to over the past month or so. Part of that is because, obviously, I'm, you know, hosting, I'm judging the events that I would usually be playing in, but also... I've just been working a lot, guys. Not not like a big flex, but I've been trying to pull out as many hours as I can per week. I've been substitute teaching a lot. I've been working retail, and I've been trying to save up as much money as I can so that I can try and go out to more of these bigger events. And then now you might be wondering, Mark, why would I even decide to become a judge, Mark? Mark, I just want to play the game. I want to hustle and grustle and grind. I don't need to judge. Well, Personally, for me, guys, I really wanted to boost up the community. I wanted to make sure that we kept a consistent base of people. And I knew that becoming a judge would help, so I decided to absolutely take the opportunity. Other than that, guys, I do know that there are, in the other card games, there are, like, incentive programs. Currently, MetaZoo doesn't have one yet. I would expect them to eventually come out with one. Uh, I do actually really like the, the way that Pokemon does it. Pokemon has uh, two pretty cool systems. First off, guys, they have like a reward system based on points. I guess if, you know, depending on how many events you host or something, right, you get points and you can redeem those points for like special Pokemon products and that's pretty cool. The other thing that I really personally do like is the Professor Cup. So, uh, Pokemon judges are called professor Professors. They wear the white lab coats and honestly, guys, I kind of like that. 
I, I kind of like it. It really fits in with the theme, and I think it looks pretty cool. So these Professor Cups are tournaments where only Pokemon judges can enter, and they give out certain specific super special prizes, and I think that's really, really cool. It's a, I think that's a nice reward to be able to participate in something like that. Now, giving out prizes and doing special tournaments is cool and stuff, but I think the part that I really do like about being an MZO is that there is a special MZO chat that MZOs, metazoologists, get a chance to be a part of. They get to ask questions, they get to hear a lot of the big discussions and stuff. And yeah, we get to talk about rulings more in depth. Uh, I, a lot of it's more like linguistic stuff, but I do really enjoy being there. I think it's really cool. I check up there at least uh, maybe one, two, three times a day, honestly, because a lot of the conversations there are very interesting. I think once you become an MZO, that's a stepping stone to becoming a better player just in general, really. And then also as a side note, for me personally, it's also practice for me becoming a teacher. In case you don't know, I am a substitute teacher. I'm currently working on my teaching courses, my teaching certificate, so that I can eventually become a full-time teacher and start doing that. I think that'd be pretty cool. I'm very interested in teaching accounting and business, and we'll go and see how that goes. Now, guys, we reached the best part of the podcast. Right now, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the YouTube stuff. Ooh, very exciting. So, in case y'all are not YouTubers or you're not into analytics and stuff, uh, it's okay. I'm still going to explain it to you guys and how YouTubers make money. So, personally, for me, guys, I am not in the YouTube creator fund yet. But, as a growing gamer, as someone who's been posting every day... I will hopefully be there by the end of the year. We'll go ahead and see. So, uh, so I think some of the most important stats probably for YouTubers are views as well as average watch time and click-through rates. So, click-through rate. <laughs> click-through rate. We'll keep that in, baby. So, over the past year, guys, over the past 365 days, I've hit 18,672 views. If we go ahead and calculate that per day, I'm currently averaging about 51 views per day. It's kind of meh for my average watch time. Currently, for the past month, I'm at about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Over the past year, I'm sitting at around 2 minutes and 28 seconds as an average. Now, as a click-through rate, we'll go ahead and look at that. Over the past year, I'm sitting at around 8.4%, which is pretty solid. 8.4% isn't bad, but it's not the best. And in case you guys are kind of confused on click-through rate, basically it's the combination of title and thumbnail and how good they are and how often people actually click on them. So for my videos over the past year, roughly eight people out of every hundred would actually click on the videos. Now guys, there are different ways you can make money on YouTube. You could obviously do like affiliate marketing, you could sell your own products, you could take sponsorships, you could start a Patreon, but one of the most basic, basic fundamental ways to make money on YouTube is the YouTube AdSense fund or the YouTube AdSense program, whatever you want to call it. It's basically whenever you look at a video and there's an ad before that video, typically the YouTuber will get paid for that. And that's where that money comes from. It basically just comes from YouTube's advertisers. Now, YouTube recently or over the past year or so, they got a lot more stringent on who can actually make money on the fund. And so you do have to meet two basic requirements. The first one is to hit 1,000 subscribers. As you guys can tell, you know, <laughs> I am well over 1,000 subscribers. I'm sitting at around 2.2K followers, which is pretty solid. The other portion is watch time. How many hours people are actually watching your content? Now, you need to hit a minimum of 4,000 hours of required watch time in order to even be accepted or looked at as a YouTube partner. So, 4,000 hours is the minimum. Right now, currently, I'm sitting at about 926 I am planning on trying to move that up a little bit. I have a few new series in the pipeline that you know, I don't really mind sharing. It's not a big deal. I am planning on having some more like TTS, like gameplay videos. I do know uh, Meta Bros. Meta Bros. Oh, they're they're the best channel, dude. I swear, I love watching them. Every time they upload, 
I'm just like, ooh, <laughs> let me sit, let me sit aside an hour so I can watch, because they have a lot of in-depth stuff. They have a lot of cool rulings. They show a lot of cool decks, and there's not a lot of channels out there that consistently, like every day or every other day, post MetaZoo videos. And for me personally, I'm not able to go out to the car shops every day. I'm not able to. I don't really have a recording buddy to do that with. Uh, that I would be able to record consistently with. And then I think for me personally, I just have the most experience with TTS, with Tabletop Simulator, with recording on computers and editing through that. So I feel like that would probably be the avenue I'd want to take. Outside of that, I'm also interested in starting like a judge ruling series. I feel like I'm at the point where I can probably do that. I have enough experience as a judge, I feel like, to go ahead and start doing that. I have the first three videos actually already scripted, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I have the first three videos scripted, and they're looking pretty good. And then obviously, guys, I am starting the podcast. I mean, if you guys made it this far in the video, you 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 guys already know. And I do also feel like over the next year or two, MetaZoo will absolutely grow as a card game, as a brand, and that will lift all all the different channels that are on MetaZoo YouTube. So Meta Bros, Caster Society, me, everyone. It's going to boost everyone, I feel like, as it grows as a card game. I mean, I, I've seen that over on uh, Yu-Gi-Tube. I, you know, I, I still keep up with, uh, with uh, Yu-Gi-Tube sometimes or the Yu-Gi-Oh! YouTube sphere. And I've seen that card game grow over time. And I feel like MetaZoo can absolutely do the same where Yu-Gi-Oh started off with like super basic deck profiles and maybe like really basic low editing videos. But then now, oh man, now Yu-Gi-Oh tube, the Yu-Gi-Oh sphere is absolutely ridiculous. Like, like there are some channels out there on Yu-Gi-Oh sphere that are accruing like 100,000 views a video, which back in 2010, 2011, 2012, you would never expect that. Never, ever would you think, oh yeah, my video is going to get 100k views. There's no shot. No way that would ever possibly happen. But I feel like MetaZoo will eventually get there, personally, guys. I mean, I, I just think it's really good. I, I think there's no shot that it doesn't get there, you know? Now, guys, the last part of the video. In case you guys don't know, I will be trying to go out to the Dueling Brothers tournament next month. There is a medal tournament. And I will be planning on going with my boy John and Mateo. So we'll go ahead and see how we can do there. Personally, I have not played in an event in a little bit. I do feel like I need to get some more practice in before the month ends and before the tournament starts. So we'll go ahead and see about that. I'm not exactly sure on what aura type I want to be running yet. Lightning is really solid. I feel like with Call of the Storm and stuff, it's really good. You don't have to play crystals anymore in the deck, which is also really solid. You can just play Wakinyans and go Ka -ka! and pay the 50 life points and do that. And that's really cool. So you have a little bit of extra ramping there. You have Call of the Storm. Quetzalcoatlus is always going to be a beast. And outside of that, I feel like water is also pretty solid. I do luckily have the resources to play a full powered water deck. So... I just feel like it's a really solid control deck. You know, Mailman, Frogman, Oklahoma Octopus, the Crabs. Crabs are just the scariest beastie ever because you have to deal double damage to them. You have to get them down 110 life points to, to effectively kill a crab, which is absolutely ridiculous. If you are able to paralyze it, cool. But, you know, it's kind of tough to do that. And then outside of that, Lightning has been going away from playing Radioactive Hornets. So the Lightning to Water matchup is much better. It's much more in the favor of Water at this point because Lightning doesn't have the massive amounts of bodies that it can put up usually with Radioactive Hornets. Now they're playing more like Cats. They're playing Thunderbirds. They're playing Gargantuan Gliders. They're playing more bigger beasties and not spreading out as much with tokens and ding bells and stuff, which, you know, is water's weakness. If, you know, you can't... W water doesn't get rid of wide things, it gets rid of big things, which I think is pretty important if you guys are playing water. You need to make sure that you guys are patient and trying to make the best plays possible because, 
you know, the deck isn't very aggressive, but it is very controlling. And then outside of that, Cosmic, I don't think there's a way. I don't think there is. I don't think I play Cosmic. Specifically because I feel like I can't pilot it. I did have some playtest games the other day where I was trying to play it. And maybe if, maybe it was me, maybe it was Tabletop Sim. I don't know, but I didn't feel comfortable with it. I just don't feel comfortable with that aura type at all. I don't think it jives with me. Fire is also one of those aura types that I feel like are also very, very solid. I did see in the most recent Collecticon that just ended yesterday that Easton was actually piloting a very, very good fire kind of dark deck. He was playing green fireballs, headless coal miners, and I thought it was pretty cool, pretty creative. I liked it a lot, and I feel like as an anti-meta deck, it is very good. Obviously, it loses extremely hard to the water matchup. In case you guys didn't see the, I think it was the final round, uh, Easton was playing against a water player, and it's just very tough for fire to beat water, specifically because they just have so many big threats, and the fire spells that you have in the game don't do enough to counteract a lot of these things. So Oklahoma Octopus has more than 60 health. So your biggest spell in the deck does like 60 damage. You're not killing an octopus. You're not killing a mana ray. You're not killing a... I guess you kill a mailman. But outside of that, I mean, crab has stone skin. You know, regular frog, leveling frogman has magic proof. So it's just kind of difficult. And then you're also running a bunch of solo beasties bunch of beasties that rely more on spirit but it doesn't matter because frogman can go ahead and just go shoop, use the power go ahead and charm the spirits and one of the other things is i wonder how the cosmic matchup is against fire because fire relies pretty heavily on spirit but if you're playing against cosmic they don't really care about spirit they can go ahead and just use the laser beam gun upgrade and zap it and just deal with it they don't really care about spirits which is wild on the other hand i am also considering playing fearsome critters just because i feel like they're just overall a very solid deck a very aggressive looking deck and i do like them i'm not sure if i want to run basic fearsome critters or if i want to be running more like the cactus cat fearsome critters i'm not sure exactly which way i want to take it yet but I feel like they're a pretty cool deck. They're pretty fun. I mean, Gumbru's a menace. Gumbru's an absolute terror. Unless you paralyze him, he's staying on the field and you're not getting rid of him. And then now, especially with the addition of Forest Elemental, you know, the lighting matchup has become so much easier. If, the, if Lightning does not have a first year anniversary, they're not getting rid of Forest Elemental because he's a spirit. And he's really, really good. He's just a really good BC overall. I think it's a great addition to the deck. And so, guys, that's pretty much it. Hopefully, you all enjoyed the first episode. I know this episode might have been a little bit more, you know, kind of iffy. But, you know, it's the first episode. I'm just getting more comfortable. Especially especially that I can't show my face. It's kind of weird. Uh, maybe next time I will. But... You know, it just depends. If you guys liked it, make sure you leave a like. Make sure you subscribe. And tell me how you liked the format of the video. I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to have something where people could listen to on the car ride. Because I know for me, I watch... Half of my YouTube is on my phone. Half of my YouTube time is just me driving and doing stuff. And I just thought this would be an easy listen, hopefully. Um, hope you guys liked it. I'll see you later. Goodbye. Blah.